Amen. Amen. You guys ready for the word? Let's go. Hey, uh, we are in part three of dealing with devils. Dealing with devils. I just want y'all to know that I went back and listened to the message last week, and uh, I am sorry. I just want to say that. I, it was, I don't know what was in my coffee, but I was having a good time up here preaching last week. Uh, how many know the Lord is faithful? He is good. Um, but I want us to understand the context of everything that we're facing and what we're walking in. And the whole heart behind this series is uh, I was talking with someone out front before service. And uh, the truth is this. is like most, most people think like, well, I get saved. I, I, you know, I believe in Jesus. I'm going to go to heaven one day. But they don't realize all that happens between here and then. They don't realize that, that what, what's, we're walking out, what we're living. How many know every day that we're living, like there is a battle going on that's around us and sometimes even within us and like we need the Lord's victory, not just his full and final victory one day when he returns, but we need the victory now to walk it out in this life, amen? And so um, I, I wanna give a little bit of a, a recap for those who maybe are jumping in for the first time today and you don't know what we've been talking about. Uh, so the first week, I, I laid the foundation in talking about uh, the reality of this other realm, the reality that there are these beings, these little e Elohim, these little Gs, <laughs> gods, little, little Gs. And so, um, and so I was like, little Gs, someone went, yeah. And so like, it's <laughs> but like these little Gs, little gods, and, and th those that, that try to rise up and exalt themselves to be worshiped like the most high God. Again, Yahweh is called the most high. So if he is the most high God, that means there are these other beings. And they were, they were simply these Elohim that God had given the nations over to. You can find this in Deuteronomy 32, I believe it is, in Psalm 82, uh, where you see the Lord talking about giving them over uh, to these, these chief princes or spirits to steward them but instead of stewarding these geographical areas toward Yahweh, and the way I would say it, they're almost our like regional managers, okay? And so, like, they, they were over these regions. Instead of stewarding them back to Yahweh, they let them worship them so that they exalted themselves and they started not stewarding the people well. So, in turn, Yahweh says he's going to judge those little G gods. Uh, because of their lack of faithfulness toward him, because he is the most high God. Now, I want to be clear, this is not a pantheon of equal gods. That's not what I'm talking about. Yahweh is the only creator almighty God. Everything that exists was created by him. Amen? So they're, they're not, he has no rival, he has no equal. We sing that, I believe that, it's in the word, like that is the truth. It, it is not this duality of, of Lucifer and God equal fighting yin and yang, that's not what it is. He is the most high God over it all. And I need us to know that foundationally, okay? Then last week I began talking about how, how we walk out this victory in our life. Uh, and how the enemy is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, and how we make sure to walk in the freedom that God has given us, that there is what the enemy is trying to do, there's what we do and we're called to do as disciples of Jesus, and then there's the promise of what God would do, that he would establish us, he would plant us firmly, he would protect us, he would be there for us, he would restore us, and, and how many know God will do what he says he will do? He's not a man that he should lie, Amen. And so I want to read a couple of passages, and these kind of set as foundational text for where we're going today to, to let us get a picture of the world that we live in. Daniel chapter, 12, uh, chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. This is that passage I talked about uh, the first week when it talks about, in Daniel chapter 10, this, this spirit that was over this region that was resisting the angelic messengers of heaven that were bringing an answer to Daniel's prayer. And it says in... Chapter 10, verse 12, it says, Then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. I, I want to just stop there for a second. Don't let anybody tell you your words don't matter. Do you hear this, this angel telling Daniel, I came because of your words? Because the posture of your heart and the content of what you are saying is the reason that I'm here. It goes verse 13 that says, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. Chief princes, it's a, it's a chief spirit. It's like an archangel, so to speak. 
came to help me, for I had been left alone with the kings of Persia. So in other words, what this, this messenger, like we, we, I think sometimes we fail to, to imagine this as this, re, this reality that is actually going on and has dynamics. Like this, this angel says, I came with an answer, but I came alone and I was left alone with all of these other spirits that are over this region, including the prince of Persia. Or the, we could even say the principality of Persia. And then it says, the Lord had to send Michael, an ark or chief prince, an archangel, to come so that I could have victory to come to you with the answer. So, so one, we've got to understand the posture of our heart matters. Two, we've got to understand our words matter. Prayer makes a difference. And it affects things. But three, we've got to understand there is this dynamic and this tension that is going on in the spirit realm. Now, we get over into the New Testament and we understand that Jesus has disarmed those principalities. So in other words, because of the cross, no matter what spirit is coming against you, it has no victory over you. The only victory it can have is the victory that you give to it. Can somebody say amen? Amen. So, so we see this is happening in this context. We say, well, well, I, I don't know about this spiritual resistance and, and what it looks like. Let's look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is a, a New Testament context. The Apostle Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica. And it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 18, look what it says. Therefore, we wanted to come to you. Paul's saying he wanted to visit this church. Even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. So again, this shows that Satan, the enemy of our soul, is resisting not only what God wants to do in our life, but the mission that Jesus has called us to enter into. He is going to resist us. So let's pray over this and let's jump into it today. Lord, I love you. Thank you for your goodness and your grace. I pray for a fresh anointing to say what you once said. Lord, I pray that if I say anything that's in and of myself, guard the people's hearts. But if what I say is from you, let it find good ground to bring forth a harvest in Jesus' mighty and strong name. And everybody says amen Amen and amen. So again, I wanted to lay this this context of this very real warfare that's taking place all around us all the time to understand that for us to be uh, effective and to be uh, successful in what God has called us to in the mission Uh, that God has set before us as a church, it is essential that we understand that there are spirits that are opposing the work of God in this region. There are spirits that are opposing the work of God in our lives. Uh, How many know there are are things even in scripture known as familiar spirits? Uh, And what I mean by that is there are spirits that are assigned to generations and families and and all of that. And you wonder like, how many know, like, like, anybody been to a psychic? Don't raise your hand because I'm going to tell you you shouldn't be going to a psychic. But anyway, like, it's a trick question. I was going to be like, I'm praying for you and I'm praying for you. Uh, But like, like, don't go to psychics because this is what psychics will do. Psychics will set them to be like, I mean, some of them just make stuff up. But some of them, they're like, hum, 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 <laughs> Amen, bro. And when they do that, it's like, I see your grandfather. He's really old. <laughs> and uh, he likes coffee and doesn't like people being on his lawn. I perceive he likes peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and going fishing. How did you know? First of all, that makes up like 93% of grandpas, okay? Grandpas like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. They like to go fishing, and they don't want you to get on their lawn. Like, that's 93% of grandpas. So statistically, they're going to have some hits there. But this is the thing. It's like, but what we don't know sometimes is then they may say something even more specific. They may say, uh, and I see your grandfather taking you fishing, and, and, and you fell in, and he jumped in and saved you, and, and, and since that day, you've had a special bond and connection, and you're like, how did you know that? See, the thing is this. It's not that the psychic's talking to grandpa. How many know that, that even though like the Lord saw that happen, so did the other spirits that are around, and that psychic is simply talking to a demon? And that demon is trying to get you to open yourself up so it can have a soul connection with you and it can connect you and it can bring you into bondage. 
So, so like those familiar spirits that they're observing, they're watching, they're not only just observing so they can, you know, talk to Miss Cleo, but also they, they're observing because they want to know your weaknesses. They want to know your vulnerabilities. They want to know how to attack you. They want to know how to, they have reconnaissance missions. They scout you out. They watch you. They study you. They study your family life. Like you ever notice like when it seems like we, we make this saying like when it rains, it pours. Like, like it seems like if something bad happens, something else is going to happen too. It's because the enemy throws combo punches. And what I mean by that is, is like the enemy is going to try his best to take you out. He doesn't fight fair. He comes to, uh, to seek to kill, to steal, and to, sh to destroy. But, but God has come, Jesus has come that we may have life and we may have it more abundantly. How many is thankful that Jesus doesn't leave us alone to fight this battle, but that he has given us the victory in his name? And you say, well, well, well Pastor, I, I know you're talking about all this, but why are you like, leaning in on this? Because I think we really got to live with an awareness that there's an enemy setting traps. So, so like, brother, when you're at the water cooler and that, that female coworker comes up and she starts flirting, don't be like, oh, I'm really enjoying this. Like, she's, uh, yeah, I just need, mama don't give me no attention. I just need, daddy, need, daddy needs a little attention, you know, like, no, no. Well, first of all, mama will find you and she will take you out. I just want to say that. <laughs> she will. She will. Well, let me, let me bring it to the other side. Ladies, like, like, like don't be like, well, I'm going out. It's, you know, like, I, I'm going to hang out and go, go out with the girls now and whatever. And then, like, like, all these young bucks come up and they're like, what's up, mama? And you're like, oh, I still got it. <laughs> the enemy lays traps. And he will try to take you out. And we have to be sober. And we have to be vigilant. We have to be aware. We have to understand. Let, let me just say this. Y'all listen to me? Like, like say this. Say, say marriage. marriage. Don't do stuff that compromises it. Don't put yourself in positions. Don't, there, there's some places married people have no business going. Like, like there's just no, no reason to go there. Like if you're married, you have no reason to be out on Broadway for a friend date. Okay? No reason to be on Broadway. Like it is going to be a place where drunk people of the opposite sex are groveling over you and all of that. That is a place for enticements and traps. Like, like why would I want to go into a house of horrors in the spirit and a place that the enemy has a trap at every turn where I, turn, I look? Like, like that is foolishness. Can we thank God for those that can walk into wisdom? Wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Everybody's like, why is Pastor talking about that today? Because I've seen time and time again people sitting in my office, tears running down their face because they put themselves in a compromising position, and we have to have better wisdom than that. Can somebody say amen today? So I, I want to lean in on something for the next little bit uh, that I think is important for us when talking about these spirits, because again, there's the spirits of deception and spirits of perversion and spirits of, you know, temptation and, and all of this. And, uh, and there's spirits that sow discord and division and all of that. And, and we, we've seen those things operate in our nation and our world. But let's look at what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 is something I want to lean into because I believe one of the greatest enemies of the church is actually not a spirit necessarily of uh, perversion that finds its way into the church, but a spirit of religion. And, and this is something that we have to face and we have to overcome. Second Timothy chapter three, beginning in verse one, says, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure. This is, this is key. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness. Say that with me. Say form of godliness. It goes on to say, but denying its power and from such people turn away. But denying its power. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power. But right before that, it says they love pleasure more than they love God. Now, I think when we read they love pleasure more than God, our mind immediately goes to licentious living. Our mind goes to, to perversion, and that is an aspect to it. But what I want to say that may, may wreck your paradigm a little bit is some of us take pleasure in religiosity. 
Some of us take pleasure in legalistic rules. Some of us take pleasure in arrogant, pompous attitudes. Some of us take pleasure in feeling better than the person next to us. Some of us take pleasure in feeling better than the sinner that walks in beating their chest and falling in the altar and says, here I am, a sinner, save me, God. Some of us, we take pleasure and pride in our own righteousness. But can I tell you, that is a form of God, but you're denying the power thereof. And, and the, the power thereof is not just uh, this pageantry of religiosity. It is this power that transforms our actual heart and makes us more like Jesus. That's the power that the Lord wants us to lean into. That's the true power of the Holy Spirit at work. And if we're not careful, we can get caught up in what we're doing and never lean into the actual freedom that Jesus has. I remember when I, when I was first really turned on to the whole aspect of the finished work of Christ and what Jesus has done and, and the power of his grace and, and all of that. Like, like It was revolutionary for me because I had been taught this works mentality where I had to earn it and, and I had to achieve it. And like, if I'd get really good this week, he would love me. If I didn't, then he kind of really didn't like me. And, and like, he was impatient with me and like, he was, he was just fed up with me. And like, I, he was waiting for me to make a mistake so he could just drop the hammer on me at any moment. And like, that's the way I always saw God. But, but when I realized like what Jesus has done, it liberated my soul. I can rest in the finished work of Jesus and know that I am justified by what he has done. I am righteous because he is righteous. I am, I am holy because he has made me holy. Like I am free and I am walking in victory because he has made me free and whom the son has set free is free indeed. And the enemy cannot have me. He cannot have my marriage. He cannot have my family. He cannot have my children, cannot have my church, cannot have my future, cannot have my life, cannot have my, God is a God who restores and, and anything the enemy, I'm telling you this morning, anything the enemy comes to steal, God will reach pay and multiply it when he brings it back into your life. You say, well, how do you know that? Job, look at Job. Job lost everything, but God says, watch what I'm about to do. And in turn, he multiplied what he had. Look at Mordecai in the Old Testament. He was, he was, he was oppressed by, by Haman and all of this empire. But, but at the end, it says he was promoted. Look at Joseph, who was thrown into a pit and thrown into a prison. But at the end of it, God elevated him and multiplied his influence and impact in his future. I'm telling you today, no matter what you're facing, what you're going through, if you will just trust the Lord, the Lord will bring you to the other side and he will bring promotion and blessing and multiplication because he is a God who keeps his word. If you believe that, would you give him praise? He's going to do what he said he would do. Like his promises are yes and amen in Christ. But the truth is this, is that sometimes we get caught up in the dead function of religion. If we would all be honest in this place, who would say, and just as you say, I recognize it, there was a season that I was addicted to religion. I appreciate seven of you being honest this morning, but I'm kidding. Probably if you are struggling with it, you can't raise your hand. I'm not saying because you didn't, you're struggling with it. I'm saying if you are struggling with it, you can't raise your hand. Because religion is about image. That's why I wanted to do that illustration. Religion is about image. You would rather look holy than be holy. Like, like religion is about position and posture and prestige. And, and it's, it's all about this pompous attitude that, that I am God's chosen. I am this. I am that. And, and it's grounded in arrogance, which isn't bearing the image of Yahweh. It's bearing the image of Lucifer who is ultimately prideful and arrogant. But we see that Jesus came, wrapped himself in humanity, lowered himself, became one of us so that he could rescue us and redeem us. He modeled humility. He washed the feet of his disciples. He modeled humility for us. And so when it comes to this, and, and really this whole, this whole aspect of the power of the Holy Spirit and not making sure we don't deny the full power of the Spirit of God and the power of the gospel and the power of, of transformation. Like we've got to understand there are in every move, and, and I've talked about this before, in every move, historians will say there are three major generations. 
there is the tent, the temple, and the tomb. And the tent generation is that generation that saw and experienced the power of God. They've seen and experienced the power of God. And, and, and this, this they maybe they're called tent because maybe they didn't have all the nicest stuff. They were grassroots. They were just hungry for God. They, they were a move of God, and all they cared about was Jesus. Then, then it makes way to the temple generation. Temple generation, you get nicer things. You get nicer buildings. You get more stuff. And, and there's a reason I'm saying this, because I want to guard against this as a church to make sure that with all the nice things God is giving us, that we don't rest in the laurels of what God has already done, but we continue to press in with holy hunger and passion to see the kingdom of God realized in our life and our sons and daughters. It says tent, tent was seen and experienced. The temple they, they've seen but not experienced. And this eventually gives way to the tomb generation. They've neither seen nor experienced. So in other words, you have a generation that, uh, first generation maybe a believer that, that they got saved and, 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 and man, they've seen the power of God at work and their life is transformed. Then you have a generation that comes up that, well, they've seen what God can do, but they haven't really experienced it for themselves. But it eventually gives way to one that's neither seen nor experienced. So when we talk about the power of God, to them, it's just as fictional as talking about Peter Pan. And I can't help but think about in the book of Judges where they said, where are the miracles of our fathers? This whole generation that, that had heard about all that God had done and bringing them through the Red Sea and, and splitting that and bringing them through the wilderness, all these stories of miracles, water flowing from the rock, like, like all of these amazing stories. But they're saying, where's the miracles of our father? What is God doing in our generation? And what I believe is this, is, is I don't believe that at Gateway Church, we have a tomb generation. I believe we have a womb generation that God is going to give birth to something that's incredible and a generation that God is raising up here of our sons and our daughters because we as a people will not settle for dead religion, but we will lean into the fullness of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit. If you believe that, would you give him praise? You see, what happens if we're not careful is we go from a movement to a monument. And, and, and a movement is, is flexible. It's, it's able to move. It's able to go about, it. even in the name movement, it's, it's about moving. It's about being able to, and when you are a tent, how many know you can pick up and move that tent and, and put it somewhere else? You are willing to be flexible, to follow the Lord wherever he goes. But sometimes when you get into the temple, you get rigid. And if we're not careful, we start making church rules that's nowhere in God's word. And we start passing judgment that's not the heart of the Father. And we start treating people in a way that isn't the heart of the Father. We, we start doing things that is not the heart of the Lord. And, and we do it because we create our own man-made religiosity and ideals. And, and we have to be very careful with this, that we don't become the God squad that is constantly looking to find people at fault and to point fingers at them. There is a difference between overt sin and trying to help a brother and rescue a brother and trying to look around and judge people for everything that may be an open-handed issue. We've got to make sure that we let God work in our heart. And the reason I say this is I believe there is a spirit of religion. There is a, and if I would just say it this way, maybe whether there is a spirit specifically of religion, I will say it at least this way. There are spirits that are okay and work to get us addicted to religion. And, and the reason I say that is because these spirits all they want to do is detour you from being a spirit-empowered, transformed, humble, kind, fruit-of-the-spirit kind of person that bears witness of Jesus. They would much rather you be a person that is resting in the laurels of your own righteousness and your, your own ideology and your own pride and your own opinion instead of walking with a contrite heart that is humble and a posture of saying, God, show me your will and show me your ways. The enemy is okay with that. The enemy is not intimidated by people that can quote scripture but not live it. The enemy is not intimidated by people that can throw rules around but have no humility. That doesn't bother him. That's actually what he wants to get us into because a religious spirit's primary function is this, to stand in the way of the spirit of God's true work, reaching the lost, discipling believers, expressing the kingdom, and offers in its place a pseudo-spirituality based on conformity, 
praise of men, and legalistic overtones. I'm gonna say that last part again. Offers in its place a pseudo-spirituality based on conformity, the praise of men, and legalistic overtones. So many times when we get caught up in a religious spirit, now there, there's a couple of, of angles of this that I wanna warn you about, is there is the religious spirit that gets us not to acknowledge the reality that we have an enemy. They, they see it as weird, and it's very stuffy religion. Anybody know what I'm talking about, stuffy religion? Like, where like you don't talk about angels, you don't talk about demons, you don't talk about the Holy Ghost, like all you talk about is like the Lord died for our sins and we'll go to heaven one day, amen. Like, and they just don't sin, <laughs> that's what you talk about. And all that's true, but, but it's missing so much. So there's like stuffy religion, and then there's like fruitcake religion. Everything's a demon. You sneeze, there's a demon. You cough, demon. Get upset at a football game, demon. Pokemon, demons. I remember when I was a kid, we had those little troll dolls, man, and people were like trying to cast demons out of kids that had troll dolls, I remember that. Like, like you, can, you can be, and this is, this is what messes people up because people think like not being religious means I get super flaky. That's, that's religion, just another variation to where you're like become like the gateway ghostbusters and everything is like you're, you're trying to find demons and you're trying to do this and like you just get weird and you get flaky. Like, like all that religion is, is you're adopting this inflexible uh, ideology that keeps you from being led by the spirit in truth. And, and so the enemy will let you adopt whatever kind of religion you want as long as it's religion that keeps you from relationship, that keeps you from being in a humble posture, that keeps you from being teachable and moldable and shapeable, that makes his word not be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. That's what the enemy wants. And there's a danger in this because the danger is that this spirit is so deceitful that it appears righteous at heart. Righteous at heart. Can I tell y'all the most menacing, evil people I've ever dealt with in this church it is not someone that has a pentagram on their forehead. That's not the most evil kind of person I've dealt with. The most evil person I've ever dealt with in this church and the kinds of people I've dealt with in this church that are the most evil, I'm talking about laced up with demonic spirits, are people that look the most Christian. I'm telling you, because they know how. I'm, they got that whole Jezebel thing going on where they, they know how to manipulate. They know, oh, I'm just so, I just love everybody. I, I love y'all. And I, I just, it's just, I'm just so honored to be in the house of the Lord. And I'm just, and they got this like all this, anybody seen like false humility? Makes me gag. You know what I'm talking about? Like, oh, no. It, because you know why? They like to look humble. I would rather just be humble than to try to work at looking humble. Because working at looking humble is actually the opposite of humble. Because then you're trying to do it in your own self-righteousness and self-humility. And you're trying to posture yourself to look like the most humble one. And, and that's not humility. Humility prefers others. It doesn't, it's not thinking about how my image is. It's thinking about, I'm going to bear an image of him. I just want Jesus to be known. That's all that it cares about when you walk in true and sincere humility. But just because somebody, like, they talk the talk and they, oh, jolly jeepers, I love Jesus, I love you, and you oh, yeah, you know? <laughs> I'm like, first of all, that creeps me out, okay? But, but that doesn't mean anything. Look what it says in the Bible. It says, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 through 15, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, there, there's, this next two words are important. Transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, whose ministers? Did you know he has ministers? Listen. Listen. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness 
whose end will be according to their works. That is a mouthful. That, notice the phrase that kept coming up was transforming themselves. Transforming themselves. Can I tell somebody, I, I, yeah, do what you can do, I get it, like do good works, God's created you for it, but you can't transform yourself. I can't transform myself. I, I can't change my heart, I can't change my affections. Only the spirit of the living God can transform you truly and who you are. Otherwise, all that we can do is transform our appearance. That's why it says the enemy can appear as an angel of light. Can I tell you he's not? Can, can I also tell you that, that we can transform ourselves to appear as ministers of righteousness, but not be that? And so we have to make sure that we're not just posturing ourselves in religion, but that we have humbled ourselves in true, sincere transformation by the Spirit of the living God. So what are some, some signs that you may have a spirit of religion at work in your life? Because I know, like, I'm, I, I know what I'm saying. I've studied this message out. I'm preaching it. And right now, at this point in this message, I'm wondering, do I have a spirit of religion? Like, we should ask that question. The first thing I would say that would make you realize you might have that spirit is if you can't ask that question. If you can't humble yourself to say, Lord, search my heart, you probably have a spirit of religion and pride. And this, the Lord wants to break that today, amen? And so let me give you some characteristics of the religious spirit, okay? And we can, we can diagnose this as the Holy Spirit reveals. Number one is a faulty view of salvation. A faulty view of salvation. In other words, it is works-driven often and, and condemnation-based. And, and again, I told you before, this is how I live most of my life. Most of my life was trying to earn God's love. Most of my life was trying to get him just to love me and care about me. And, and, and so there's, there's those, those two extremes I talked about, the one that's trying to work for his love, the other one that just doesn't care about what you do, that says, well, it's all under grace, and you have no concern at all for honoring God with your life. And those are different ends of the same, or two sides of the same coin. And, and both of those are a spirit of religion. It's just a different kind of religion. But what the Lord wants is what James 2 says, this synergy that takes place in our life with faith and works to where we start living out this life producing fruit of the Holy Spirit, bearing fruit of the Holy Spirit, not manufacturing it ourselves, like where the Lord produces it naturally through us. So one is a faulty view of salvation. Number two is we start majoring on the minors. We start majoring on the minors. This is when people would rather debate than discuss. When, when they, everybody tries to prove a point, everybody tries to say, no, this is what it actually, no, actually, this is what it actually says. I remember one time I was preaching and I, and I used someone's name, I think it was Leah in the Old Testament, and I said her name means tired. And there's some tired people here today, and God wants to, and I was just preaching that whole thing. This guy met me after service and he goes, actually. <laughs> Usually if you start a sentence with the word actually, you probably have a religious spirit, so. But he goes, actually, it doesn't mean tired. It means weary. <laughs> like, bro, do you have a thesaurus? <laughs> Forgive me. In trying to interpret or translate an ancient language into our English language, and I didn't use the synonym that you wanted me to use, Instead, I, I said tired when you wanted me to say weary, like, like what is the same thing, bro? But he wanted to argue this. These are the kind of people that will argue, did Adam have a belly button? I started to show the article, a church in Florida split over the argument if Adam had a belly button. I mean, you kind of think about it. He wasn't in a womb, so there wasn't an umbilical cord, so would there be a belly button? And somebody said, God made him, went, you're done. And that was it. <laughs> so, like, like, I'm telling you, somewhere there is a church called Adam's Belly Button Church of the Most High God. Like, it is, like, they will, people will start a church and split a church over anything they can find because there is a religious spirit that's at play in this. And we've got to get to the place, again, majoring on the minors where we've got to understand there are open hand and close handed things. Close hand means I will fight you over it. 
Open hand means, God, it's, it's up to God. I don't know that I can prove this. Close hand, the word of God is infallible. It is God-breathed. It is inspired by the Holy Spirit. That, I, will, I will fight over that. I will fight over Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father to be saved. I will fight over that. I will fight over so, so many of the, but there's open-handed things too. When is the rapture? And for those that say, well, actually, rapture is not in the Bible, neither is Trinity, but we believe it. It's a theological term that describes a biblical truth. When Jesus will catch us up in the clouds to meet him in the air, and so shall we ever be. The dead in Christ will rise first, and those who are alive and remain will be caught up. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen? Amen. 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 Open-handed, I don't know when. Okay? Y'all ready for this one? The consumption of alcohol. Some of y'all are like, I don't know about this, brother. Others will be like, he, he, he's drinking privately. That's why he's justifying it. <laughs> if you only knew what was in that coffee cup this morning, I'm kidding. <laughs> but, but the reality... <laughs> the reality is this. Is that some of the same people that will throw stones about having a glass of, of wine, okay, for a, for a believer... Uh, are some of the same people that will be addicted to pain medication. Now, let me say this. Do I think it's wise? No. Do I, do I as a believer? No. As a pastor? No. Do I have a covenant as a pastor of this church not to do it? Yes, I do. Does our staff have a covenant not to do it? Yes, we do. So like we have an agreement not to do it because it's not wise. Remember what I said earlier about not setting yourself in positions for the enemy to take you out because you, you, you did. Now, this is one of those things that's like, like why would you, first of all, it's empty calories. It, it doesn't make any sense, okay? <laughs> like it, it makes it, I'm, I'm, I, I am at the point in my life where every calorie matters. <laughs> and I'm trying to redeem them, okay? And so I want that blueberry muffin and so I'm gonna make sure I don't drink anything like this. But like, but like it, it's one of those things where it, like, it can become a stumbling block. It can cause you to fall. But, but is it a salvation issue is what I'm talking about? No. Because even in Scripture, like, they're told, like, you have a little wine for the stomach's sake and this and that. But like, it's in moderation. What is close-handed is drunkenness. Now, now, again, for those watching online... Our official stance as a church is we do not believe in the consumption of alcohol. But I ain't gonna say you're gonna go to hell if you have a drink, all right? And because it's open-handed. And, and if I turned everyone away from this church that did, we would have probably 35 people in this church, okay? So we've gotta make sure that we don't argue over the things that don't matter. I've told you this before, and I say this at love. Like, smoking may not send you to hell, it just makes you smell like you've been there. You know what I'm saying? Like... <laughs> That was that one you told me not to say again, wasn't it? Yeah, sorry. I realized as I said that. But there's open-handed things that, that man, we just, we, we can't, we don't need to get hung up on this. Like, should we have instruments or not have instruments? Should someone dance or not dance in the, before the Lord? Should, should we shout or not shout? I heard someone speaking in tongues, like, oh my God. Like, like we, we can't argue over open-handed issues and build something that God has called us to build. We gotta have the humility to say, I don't know everything, but then also the courage to say, what I do know, I know, and it's the word of the Lord, and I'm gonna build my life on the word of God. Some things are wisdom, not necessarily salvation-based. But the Lord wants all of our life and us to walk in the light and in his wisdom. Number three is we substitute religious activity for the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the ultimate arrogance. I don't need your help. I can do this. Can I tell you we need less self-help and more self-denial? Where we deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow after Jesus. Number four, we have an unhealthy focus on the sin of others. 
In other words, we're so obsessed with what other people are doing. And can I tell you, when I see disciples of Jesus, Paul says, I'm the most wretched of all sinners. I am the least of the apostles. Like, he was more concerned with his own heart and his own life than he was throwing stones at other people. And I believe God is calling us to that. You see, this is the thing too, is number five, is, is we can know the scriptures, but not the word. And this is a sign of a religious spirit. And they try to use the letter of the law to tear people down, to hit them over the head with it instead of trying to build them up and call them to life. And, and that's important for us to understand that, the, that the, even the Pharisees, they recognized scripture, but they didn't recognize the word of God when he was standing in front of them. And because they were so caught up with the spirit of religion. Can I also tell you the Bible is a living, breathing, active text. It is, it is alive. Uh, and we are not called to tame the text. What I mean by that is none of us have mastered it. It should master us. Amen? And that means that we don't have it all figured out. We are a work in progress. Number six, and this is a sign that you may have a religious spirit, is that wineskins start to matter more than the wine. Wine skins start to matter. In other words, you care more about methodology um, than you do the fruit or the harvest that God is producing. You'd rather it look your way than actually impact a generation. I, we had a, a brother that was here, uh, Brother Hart, a retired pastor. He's still a part, their family's a part of our church, and we love them, and we're praying for you if you're watching online today. But he would come for years, and he would come out in the lobby, and he would come in, and he had gun range earmuffs. And he would come into the service during worship and put his earmuffs on. And then when the worship was done, he would take it off and listen to the word of God. And I remember, I felt bad. I'm like, this, I, I'm big on like honoring, especially like, like the older generations and especially like retired pastors. And so I went to him, I said, Brother Hart, what can we do? Do I, do I need to, like, we'll turn it down more. Like, what can I do and, uh, to make this you know, easier for you? And he, and he says, son, you better not. And I said, what? He said, look at those kids up there in the altar. He goes, just let me sit back here with my earmuffs and have my good time with Jesus, and you guys keep doing what you're doing for the work of the Lord. He cared more about new wine than he did wineskins. And so if we're not careful, we will hold on. At Gateway, we're constantly having to evolve and say, God, what is the wineskin for this next season? Because we want the new wine that you're giving us, God. We want to make sure that we're humbling ourselves, that, that what worked five years ago may not be working today. And we want to make sure we're following your heart and that our church sounds like heaven. We look like heaven. We live like heaven. We love like heaven. Like, like that is the heart of Gateway Church. Can we praise God for that today? Amen. So, so some things that, that I want to say that means you may have a religious spirit. If, if you care more about what a person is wearing than the fact that they're wearing it here, they're in God's house. And, and if all you can think about is, is what they're wearing, now I believe in modesty, I get all that, but if all you can think about is what they're wearing, rather than you're glad they're here, it's a religious spirit. There's a religious spirit in your life, I'm telling you. Number two is that if coffee and refreshments before service is seen as the devil's work. I have been told because we have water bottles on the stage that we're of the spirit of Antichrist. And I'm like, what? I got reported to the state bishop. The state bishop had to call me and goes, who is this guy calling me saying that you're partnering with the devil? You can't make this stuff up. You care more about the tattoos written on someone's arm than the word of God that's written on their hearts. may have a religious spirit. I feel like I'm doing the Jeff Foxworthy, you might be a redneck right now. <laughs> you might have a religious spirit if you have been saved 384 times. That's not how salvation works, man. You might have a religious spirit if you wear a cross around your neck but refuse to put one on your back. Like, 
Like, it is a thing, like, you can look, you can have the little Jesus fish on your car, and you can have all the WWJD bracelet on, have your host 90 bracelet on, and still not walk in the leadership of the Holy Spirit. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say today that God is inviting all of us to let go of the dead, dried up, religious routine of going through motions, of striving but never resting, of pointing fingers and judging each other and criticizing each other and being fear-based and condemnation-based and inviting us to a life in the spirit where we don't transform ourselves, but he transforms us and makes us and conforms us into the image of Jesus. And, and what I believe today is that there are going to be some people that find true and lasting freedom, that we don't make disciples of religiosity, but that we make disciples of people that are in a dynamic relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that they know Jesus, he knows them, that they love him, he loves them. And you say, why does that matter? Because of Matthew 7. I didn't give them this verse, but Matthew 7 says, it's not all those that cry, Lord, Lord, that will enter in, but those that do the will of my Father. Many will say in that day, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name? That sounds religious, right? Did we not cast out demons in your name? That sounds religious. Did we not do miracles in your name? But he will say to them in that day, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness or iniquity. I never knew you. Jesus doesn't just want us performing well. He doesn't just want us checking the list and doing the works. He, he wants that, but it should be a manifestation out of our heart because we know him. What he wants first and foremost is a relationship with our heart and to know us and us know him because he loves you more than just what you can produce in your own self. Can you praise God for that today? I'm, I'm going to ask the worship team to come, but I, but I want to to read John 8 together. And, and I want you to get this in your heart today. In John chapter 8, verse 31, it says, Then Jesus said to the Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my, dis my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants. Think about this for a second. And have never been in bondage to anyone. How can, first of all, that is the dumbest thing I have ever read in all of the Bible. There's this whole thing called the Exodus. We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. It has been nothing but bondage in your history. Anyway, idiots. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, most assuredly, I say to you, Whoever commits a sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So, so why am I saying that? I'm saying that because notice that the opposition of sonship, the pushback against what Jesus was giving here, of true lasting freedom, was pride that blinded them to their own bondage. Religion will always blind you to your true bondage and will always blind you to the real issue of the condition of your heart. Again, in this story, we're descendants of Abraham, never been in bondage to anyone. What? Yes, you have. Let me count the, the numerous generations. Their pride couldn't, couldn't see beyond that. And what I believe today is that, that the Lord in all of his love for us is not here to shame you and throw stones at you and condemn you, but he's here to invite you into true sonship, into true freedom, into this everlasting freedom where you get to walk in communion with the Lord. Not that you have to come and, and after so many weeks, I, maybe I'll feel good enough and maybe if I earn my way, like maybe if I, if I fast enough and I pray, no, no. Like I need somebody to know today, no matter where you come in today from, no matter what your background, no matter what you've done, God loves you. Jesus loves you. He came, suffered, and died for you. He wants to wash your sins away. He wants to make you new. He wants to meet with you right here, right now. You cannot earn it yourself. So I'm asking you to stand your feet all around the house. 
I ask you to bow your heads. I'm gonna ask two questions today. And these questions are so important. The first one, if you'd say, Pastor, I don't know Jesus as my Lord and Savior and I need to be saved. Or maybe I've known him, but I've grown so distant and, and I feel so disconnected from him. I just want to come home. Right now is that moment, no matter what your background, no matter what you've done, the Lord loves you and he has me preaching this today because he cares that much about you. And if you'd say, I want to be saved, would you just throw your hand up right now? I won't embarrass you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Come on. Come on, let's praise God like that was your son or daughter. My second question is this, and this takes so much humility, and I know it's hard. Please hear my heart when I say this. If you would just, just keep your heads bowed for a moment. Because I know right now with every ounce of my being, the Spirit of the Lord is working on hearts because He's working on mine. And if you would say, Lord, please don't let me be bound with the spirit of religion. Let me have your heart. Let me love the way you love. Let me be like you've called me to be. I want to be like you, Jesus. Show me if there's any ways in my heart and life that is bound to this God and set me free today. I want to be free here and now. If that's you, would you just raise your hand right now and say, that's me. Thank you, thank you. Praise God. So many hands up. Let's say this prayer together. And when I say amen, if you need to go, you can go. If you want to stay in worship, stay in worship. If you would like to come up for prayer, we would love to pray with you. But I want you to know the Lord loves you so much. And I say stuff, and I joke, and I kid. Sometimes stuff I probably shouldn't say. But at the end of the day, the Lord is in this place, and he is meeting with you right here, right now. And in spite of the frailty and the inadequacies of a man on a stage, there is the God who reigns over this place and who is reigning over your life, and he is with you every single step of the way as you go forward from this place. So say this with me today. Say, King Jesus, I love you. Please forgive me of all my sins. I confess that you are my Savior and you are my Lord. I confess that I am transformed into the image of Jesus. I confess today that a spirit of religion has to go in the name of Jesus. It has no place in my home, in my heart, in my church, in my family. I declare freedom and sonship in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because I'm free because of you. In Jesus' name, can we give God praise for how good he is? God bless you. I love you all so very much. Walk in the freedom God has given you. Major on the majors, not the minors. God bless you.